Well, good evening, and thank you all for joining us for this, thanks again to the pandemic, virtual community meeting to discuss the county's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. But where we faced challenge and hardship this last year, we also found opportunity. We've applied innovation and resourcefulness and adapted technology in ways that have expanded opportunities for citizens to engage with their local government, both day to day and on many critical matters that affect every single person in Chesterfield County. Discussing the county's proposed budget is no exception. Though we look forward to the day when we can more regularly meet in person with those we serve, we also know that such meetings in the future will provide virtual elements, further enhancing convenience and opportunity for all our citizens to participate in their local government. In a moment, we're gonna hear from our county administrator, uh, Dr. Joe Casey, and then from our budget director, Gerard Durkin. I know each of these gentlemen are going to do an excellent job of presenting highlights related to the proposed budget and in preparation for taking your questions and comments tonight. And please don't be shy. We're on Facebook Live, so please uh, send in your questions and type them in online and we'll get to them at the very end. I will say though that Chesterfield has weathered the pandemic's financial storm better than most, and that's due to the county's long-standing approach to fiscal management. A critical part of that process is happening here tonight and I couldn't be more appreciative of the public's participation. I also want to thank county staff who've worked very hard to make these meetings possible. Tonight's meeting is the second in a series of community meetings focused on the proposed budget. Though each of the county's five supervisors is hosting a meeting on behalf of their respective district, all community meetings are open to anyone, no matter the district they reside in. All Clover Hill and non-Clover Hill folk are welcomed tonight. For those not able to tune in live, we've also made it possible for them to provide their input and questions about the proposed budget online. We welcome the uh, comments on the county's budget website at blueprint.chesterfield.gov or by simply sending an email to blueprint at chesterfield.gov or you can email me directly at winslowc at chesterfield.gov. And again, we're on Facebook Live, so you can ask those questions during this presentation. In addition to a copy of the full proposed budget here in my hot little hand, that website contains a lot of information intended to help citizens digest and understand the budget and the process that builds it. While we often think of springtime as budget season, it's truly a year-round effort in Chesterfield County. The budget is foremost about civic priorities, your priorities as county citizens. It is important to note that as we take a look at our projected revenue, we acknowledge that it is provided solely by your collective hard-earned tax dollar and ongoing investment in Chesterfield. At the end of each budget cycle, I look for an overall plan that matches what I'm hearing from citizens in Clover Hill, keeping in mind both short-term and long-term county data issues and goals. Following this series of virtual community meetings and prior to approving a budget for fiscal year 22, I and my fellow board members will also hold a public hearing scheduled for Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. We, at this time, plan to vote on the budget on April 7th, 2021. Thank you again for tuning in tonight. Uh, we'll now hear from our county administrator, Dr. Casey. Thank you, Mr. Winslow, and uh, welcome tonight. Uh, it was about a year or so ago, I was at my last community meeting on a budget. Uh, they really, in essence, got shut down and pivoted, uh, in essence, overnight uh, to the community uh, virtual meetings you had before us. We didn't know what those community virtual meetings would be like, uh, but I was very pleased with the engagement of so many people tuning in, listening, asking us questions, engaging with other citizens, quite frankly, and perfecting their questions, their comments, their concerns. Uh, and it's enabled us to listen in ways we've never listened before. So again, tonight is the, the repeat of a process one year later, uh, a little bit more perfected in, in how we are attuned to the, uh, the technologies that are with you tonight. 
uh, as we're in the board meeting room uh, and, and broadcasting this out in many facets that we've never done before in budget uh, community meetings. And as Mr. Winslow referenced, this is not the end. We're, we're gonna figure out how to incorporate these types of uh, gatherings, if you will, even when we start pivoting back to in-person meetings because we do find value and respect your time that you're not necessarily available to come out to every and anything that we host. Uh, therefore, we want you to feel a part of the process. So as you're going through tonight, for those that are on the Facebook Live, you know, please do type your comments in. We, we will try and do our best to answer uh, all those by the end of the night. There are certain questions that we may need to have to follow up with people and do a little bit more research to get you an honest and, and full and complete answer. You know, the budget that uh, Gerard Durkin, our acting budget director, will go over in detail with you, and I don't want to be redundant to what he will be doing, but again, there, it is a focus upon the workforce. It's a focus upon the recognition of the thousands of people who, in essence, had to pivot to a virtual environment, that the thousands of people, quite frankly, in our front lines, mostly public safety, that had to serve our people day in and day out since last March in different manners, uh, to our teachers who have figured out how to educate a child differently and to the care and attention that they needed and work with the parents of, of such children. It's really also just a, a testimonial to, to the citizens and businesses. And again, these listening exercises that we have had have enabled us to hear different needs, different cries, quite frankly, that we may not have heard before. So you're gonna hear a little bit about more targeted tax relief measures in real and personal property tax for citizens, targeted business license tax relief uh, for small businesses, but then also by default uh, benefit our large businesses. There are a lot of underlying themes in this budget. Uh, and again, we're gonna be here to go through them. It's really a perfection of what the blueprint is. The blueprint is a model, but the blueprint is something again that gets tweaked and tuned to the year 2021 based upon your feedback and thoughts. This is your product. We're just, again, the conduits that hopefully act on your behalf in trying to present what you need. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Gerard Durkin, the Acting Budget Director, to take you through the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Good evening, everyone. Um, so before we kind of jump into everything, we thought we'd lay a kind of outline of the discussion this evening, kind of go from a higher level down to the nuts and bolts of what's in our 2022 budget. I'll start out with a brief economic update, the overview of the budget as a whole, the themes of the budget that Dr. Casey just alluded to, um, our capital improvement program, what we expect for our upcoming bond referendum, and then looking ahead over the next few weeks and over the five-year plan horizon. So we always start our budget presentations with an economic backdrop and now more than ever with COVID, it's a really important thing to present. The economy, as everyone's well aware, has changed over the last year and it's really impacted our budget. Our adopted fiscal year 2021 budget anticipated a drastic decline in our revenues, like our peers had also anticipated. And when we started out in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we saw those leading typical indicators really fall the same way that they had in past recessions. And you can see that in the unemployment rate chart in front of you right now. Um, you can see at the last recession, the unemployment rate nationally peaked over at 10% over the case of over a few months. But with this pandemic hitting, it really spiked literally within a matter of weeks. Um, at one point, we were losing about 6.6 .6 million jobs in one week. And the unemployment rate nationally crested just over 14% and about 11% regionally. But thanks to the relief that we've seen from the federal level and what we've been able to do locally and other um, measures, the rebound has been rather rapid to what anyone had actually expected. And so while there's undoubtedly some healing still to happen in the marketplace, you can see the unemployment rate in particular now for the county um, is down to 4.3%. That is slightly elevated from what we had saw in December 2019, up about 1.9 percent percentage points, rather, excuse me. But that's still low by historical standards. So this chart really shows the journey from fiscal year 2020 to the budget that you see before you today. Um, it really has felt like four budgets in the last 12 months. Um, in March, when we proposed our budget, we had expected a 5.4% increase over our fiscal year 2020 budget. But in a matter of weeks, we had managed to pare back the budget by $51 million. And that's the budget that we really compare the 2022 budget um, that you see before you today from uh, $721.8 million to 806.8, an increase of about 85. 
But that $85 million you're really seeing is really a two-year budget increase. It does seem large in nominal terms. But thanks to you know, the actions that we had taken and that the board had taken with our conservative forecasting, we were able to go back in December and restore some initiatives in the budget that really laid the foundation of the 22 budget. Our pay plans, our investment in infrastructure, and investment in increasing the quality of life, which we'll touch on in the next few slides. So what really drove the revenues between fiscal year 21 and 22? Well, really three main drivers um, are real estate taxes, our sales taxes, and our personal property taxes. Our real estate taxes, the market right now is very strong has maintained the growth that we've seen over the last few years. Um, our latest uh, assessment increase is just a little over 4%. Traditionally, we like it to be within that 3 to 4% range. So the, there's no real fear over the next five-year horizon of a housing bubble that we'd seen in 2006 to 8. Though the market is strong, it's still within healthy boundaries. Local sales tax, that was one that caught a lot of people by surprise. We'd expected that to go down by about 26% we'd actually performed um, the third highest receipts for calendar year 2019 for localities over 100,000 in Virginia. So really it was a testament to, you know, we, the Chesterfield consumer really underpins the strength of the financial, financial strength of the region. Um, those people that typically worked in surrounding localities were now working from home. They were spending those dollars closer to home. And we were seeing that in our increased um, tax results. And finally, our personal property taxes, um, that's really been driven with a strong used car market. Um, the sales have been remarkably strong throughout the pandemic. And even for new vehicles, um, you'll see in the news recently, there's a shortage of components that are used in new cars, which are driving up the prices, which we are now seeing through our personal property tax assessments. And so the challenge really before us over the next few years is, you know, we can see the strength of the Chesterfield consumer and it's how we retain those dollars locally. So one of the things that um, the general public doesn't really see but is really important is, you know, the actions at the state level and what they have on us at a local level. And really what this chart shows you is that we really feel the pressure on both sides, on the revenue side and the expense side. Um, our constitutional officers, the five offices, um, we fund over 40% of their staffing component, which is just north of $40 million a year. And then you can see on the chart on the right the revenue and expenses over the years that we've had to um, take up on the state's behalf. The House Bill 599, which is state aid for local police departments, was cut in the last recession. It hasn't been restored to its level since. All told, the revenue um, side loss to us is just north of $3.4 million. And then the expense side, the real driver has been our tax relief veterans program, which is now north of $7 million. And then the inmates that we house for, on behalf of the state is just shy of 3.2 million. So all in all, the burden to the Chesterfield residents based on these state actions is about $13.6 million. And then on the school side, the state dictates a certain level of quality that we don't really accept in the county. An example is the classroom sizes at the fourth and fifth grade level. The standards of quality say that the ratio of 35 to one, our local expectation is a lot smaller than that. And so the impact that you see, you know, you've heard in the news about the state employees and teachers with the 5% increase, that has an additional impact to us because of those standards that, you know, our residents expect. So even though that's projected to provide us an additional $12 million in funding, that really does require an additional $9 to $10 million of our local tax dollars to keep that standard that everyone that expects. So our total budget, everyone here is mainly about the general fund, but obviously our budgets are larger than that. You see the general fund we said earlier is about 806.8 million. But in reality for the general government, it's about 461.6 once you take out the transfer that we give to the school system. That's spent on areas like public safety, the constitutional officers that I'd mentioned, and it's really spent on the core local services for the county. The $810 million that you see for schools includes all the sources of funding for them. As I say, our local transfer grants, state money, and federal dollars. And then finally, utilities doesn't really get as much airtime as the other two. That really focuses on our water and wastewater services, you know, upgrades to the service and any expansions. And one of the things we'll touch on a bit later is um, the rates for our utility system are lower than our peers in the region. 
So what's really been the drivers of our plan over the last 12 months? Well, I think this picture before you really illustrates that. We've not just reacted from COVID, we've learned from it. We've learned what our customer preferences are, what's important to them, and how we can do business differently, differently for everybody in the county. And as I walk through the next few slides, you'll see that really pan out with the targeted investments that we've made. Demographics is another factor that we look at when we build our budget. The single family growth is healthy over the last few years. It's nothing like the 2008 bubble that you can see there where it was about nearly 3%. But now we're really growing at a sustainable rate, about the 1.4% rate that you've seen over the last few years. And then the bottom chart shows that um, the percentage of single family units where a Chesterfield County public student resides. The decline that you're seeing there is not due to a decline in enrolment, but it's a demographic shift in a resident base who is wanting to stay here for the long run a particular, you know, our 65 plus age group. Our student enrollment is growing, but we need to remain cognizant of our service portfolio reflects the diverse needs of everyone in the county. And that's something that we look at when we build the budget that's before you today. This chart I'm sure many of you have seen before is, you know, the, the dollar bill. How do we spend that tax dollar that, you know, is entrusted to us? We spend 78 cents on every dollar on the key three components of local government, our education, public safety, and our capital. It was about a year ago that this was actually 76 cents. That doesn't seem like a lot, a two cent move, but with the magnitude of the dollars that we are proposing to invest, it really does make a huge difference on our front lines. And then really the other thing I'd like to point out is, you know, for every dollar, only six cents really goes to general government services, you know, our accounting functions, budget functions, um, procurement functions. And by being so efficient, that enables us to reinvest um, dollars back into our public safety, education, parks, roads and libraries. So as I said earlier, our 22 budget was really built on the investments that the board had started in December 2021 with our amended budget. And one of the things that we do every year is, you know, we look at our base, we really build the budget line by line, as I can personally testify and so can the budget staff. And, you know, simply restoring what we had removed in 21 is not enough. Um, it's easy to restore that, but that's not the right thing to do and it's not what's expected of us and it's not what's in the plan before you tonight. We used our um, leveraged investment in technology over the last few years to do some long-term analysis. And, you know, departments have needs every year. They're, they're servicing a growing population base. And naturally, they come and they ask for more resources to enhance the services. But before we agree to do that, one of the things that we do is we look to see if there's efficiencies within their existing appropriation. And I'm pleased to see that to say that um, as a result of this analysis, we were able to redeploy about $1.9 million into frontline services. And there's some examples before you in the chart here. General services were able to um, insource some of their custodial and painting services. Real estate with their investment in the mass appraisal system has um, able to reduce their headcount. Fire has been a really um, positive one this year. They had a training program that they had to uh, spend for some outside resources that were able to bring in back in-house, redeploying some sworn personnel back to frontline services. And so what you're seeing there is that the total request without any efficiencies would have been just under $400,000. But working with them and working through their budget, we were able to fund their need for only $44,000. And all in all, the total requests of those four that you see before you were about 1.6 million. Um, with that, we're able to save about $900,000 with that. So that's really been a really big push in this budget so far this year. And so the themes of the 22 budget really coalesce around six, recognizing the workforce, investing in children's future, our continuing commitment to public safety, enhancing our quality of life, diversifying and bolstering economic base and strengthening investment in infrastructure and technology. And over the next few slides, we'll dive into these a little bit more. So the first one, you know, 2022 is, has been said is really the year of the workforce. Um, the employees have pivoted from um, services that they could no longer provide to areas where we could still provide services, telehealth, to our frontline responders, our employees have really stepped up and showed the best and enduring qualities of the Chesterfield workforce. 
And so one of the big themes this year is, you know, saying thank you and recognizing that commitment. And one of the ways that we're able to do that through Board Actions in December was to fully fund the public safety pay plan. It totals about $13.8 million in year one. It covers about 1,300 positions. Secondly, working with our school board and school superintendent and staff to help implement the teacher pay study, impacting over 4,700 teachers and other staff. With the raises for the most compressed teachers going up by about 8 to 11% and an average of 5.5%, all told that plan was about $23.2 million. So between those two plans, we've been able to reinvest $37 million in our workforce and begin to remove the word compression from our vocabulary, as Dr. Casey has said in the past. Um, for our general government employees, we've been able to restore the 2% merit. And then some of those personnel items that we had to take out, unfortunately, with our 21 reductions, including career development funding and training programs. And then one of the things that the board had recently undertaken is the third and final aspect of this study is for um, studying the pay for the general government employee as well as the remainder of the school employees. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that all of this was achieved with local dollars. We didn't rely on state or federal dollars. We were able to find all this using our local tax base. And we've also managed to put in place, you know, a sustainable chart for these plans. For example, we set up policies for our public safety pay plan that if we ever encounter a downturn in future years, we have the reserves. We're obligated at year end to commit those reserves to ensure that the you know, compression doesn't creep back in and we're back to square one. Secondly, investing in our children's future. As I said before, but it bears repeating, the school pay plan is fully funded. We recognise the dedication of our teachers. You know, um, that over the last year, their methods of teaching have changed, but we recognise that their commitment hasn't. And then the $18 million transfer to the school system is the largest increase in history. And one of the other things that is in the budget is another $4 million for differentiated financial support and differentiated, differentiated staffing support, recognising that you know, no two schools and no two students in the county are the same. And finally, with preventive, preventative and major maintenance, um, we were able to put in another $1 million on the heel of $58 million investment that we were able to go back out to the market with the county strong bond rating. All told, Working with the school board, the superintendent and staff, we were able to fund the two top priorities for the school system in fiscal year 2022. For public safety, you know, over the years, pay has been the largest topic. With the pay study, we've been able to take that out of the equation. So now we can really pivot more resources to public safety operations and the budget just does just that. You can see some of the examples before you. For fire, we've included 20 positions for the new Midlothian Fire Station, which will fund staffing a ladder truck and medic. It fully funds the replacement of the Matoica Fire Station in fiscal year 22 in our capital improvement program. I believe the oldest fire station in the county is 69 years old. It implements a new police deployment plan. It's the first major update to the patrol command structure since 1989, at a cost of $1.8 million. We're able to fund an expansion of the police service aid program, the pipeline for future officers, as well as being able to continue our local support for the 15 grants positions that the police department were able to obtain last year. And with our bond referendum, which we'll touch on slightly later, it identifies four police stations, two fire station replacements, and two fire station renovations. And for our sheriff's office, it adds four new positions to allow staff and flexibility and facility maximization as well as courthouse security enhancements and admin support for the courthouse with COVID. Enhancing the quality of life, you know, over the last year, some of the events that we take for granted have been curtailed or we haven't even been able to go back and do them again. And our parks and library system in particular really redefined the quality of life aspect for the county. For the libraries, you know, it's no longer a case of you go there, you get a book, you check out. It, they've become learning pods, the place where you can register for vaccinations, warming centres. They've really redefined the role, and this budget recognises that, and it expands upon the commitment that the board made in December from transitioning their part-time to full-time ratio by adding an additional 10 positions with the 22 budget and top, well, excuse me, an additional seven positions in the 22 budget on top of the 10 that were passed in fiscal year 21. 
And so by the end of this five-year plan, the full-time staffing component from libraries will have risen from 80 positions to 124, a 55% increase. On the capital side for libraries, we're proposing to invest $52 million to replace two libraries and renovate additional two libraries. On our parks, we've included an additional $1.1 million to establish a new athletic field crew and principal maintenance workers. It's the largest investment in park staffing in over a decade. In that same time span, they've taken on an additional 19 sites. On the capital side, um, our capital plan includes $5.2 million for investment in River City sports sports plaques to construct two new fields and maintain our turf replacement schedule. And that comes on the heels of the $3 million that we invested in the fiscal 2021 amendments. So to give that some scope, in the space of three fiscal years, we will have invested just over $8 million in this facility. It really placing it on the map is not just a regional leader for sports tourism, but really up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States. And then finally, there's $4.5 million in here to renovate the old Beulah Elementary School to create a new parks headquarters, community centre and recreation space. And the investment that you're going to see in the parks is really not just in the new and up and coming areas, but the well established ones too. One of the things that Dr. Casey had touched on in his opening remarks is, you know, diversifying and bolstering our economic base. One of the things that's in the plan this year is it fully funds the complete zoning ordinance rewrite. It was last updated, I believe, in 1970. The businesses that we're trying to attract attract today are ra ra drastically different, excuse me, from those 50 years ago. And the plan is also mindful of the county's businesses. We recognize the struggles that they've faced over the last year. The business license exemption is proposed to increase from 300,000 to 400,000, which should exempt an additional 400 businesses from the tax and reduce the BPO bill for another 3,200 county businesses. All told, about two-thirds of county businesses will no longer pay that tax. It also recognises the financial burdens on the consumers over the past year and that targeted tax relief in the personal property exemption on vehicles from 1,000 to 1,500. That's not been adjusted since 1998 and it alleviates the personal property tax bill on approximately 14,000 vehicles. And it also expands tax relief for the elderly and disabled by factoring inflation in, into income eligibility. And so the th income threshold is projected to increase for the 100% from $28,000 to $31,500. And that will automatically adjust as the years go by with cost of living adjustments so that people who qualify today won't be negatively impacted by changes in the future but it also recognises the, the increased cost of this programme, so it also proposes a $3,000 cap to control the costs, but to also make sure that the relief that we're providing goes to those who need it the most. An investment in infrastructure, you'll see an appendix in our budget every year that we publish is, you know, there's unfunded transportation projects. This year it just hit $4 billion. But one of the things, pivoting back to that quality of life theme, is a large increase in our sidewalk and trail budget. It's $19 million programmed over the next five years, recognising that you know people go out and walk and meet their neighbours and friends and being able to interact in a safe, socially distanced manner. And it also reflects the new capital funding source, the Central Virginia Transportation Authority, an additional investment of about $116 million over the next five years. And then our, our plan also continues to adhere to all the major maintenance policies that we have in our budget. And it really sets the foundation for a November 2022 bond referendum for both the counties and schools, anticipated to be about $450 million. In recognizing all that intensive capital investment, we're proposing to add additional positions in our building and grounds and capital projects staff to really make sure that these investments start to pay off for our county residents. So you can see on the chart on the left here, our fiscal year 22 budget for our transportation projects totals about $43 million. And over the five year plan, about 211.7. Our community development aspect of our CIP as a whole is about 44% of our capital improvement program. And some of the projects you can see that are going to get underway in fiscal year 22 are on the right hand side, including Route 10 weave mitigation and the Poite widening to Woolbridge. And one of the things I'll point out in this chart is that you'll see the $10 million in revenue sharing and $50 million over the five-year plan. 
one of the things we always try to do is maximize available state dollars by if we can target our local investments. The chart you see before you is just a referendum overview from fiscal year 23 to 2019. Um, it lists out the projects by type that we're proposing to issue debt for every year from our parks, fire stations, roads and libraries. As I say, over the um, horizon, we're anticipating to issue about $150.2 million on the county side, 52 of that for the library system, 18.2 for the parks, 72 million between fire stations and police stations and about $8 million for our road systems. And finally, it, coming back to that utilities component, last year the rates on everyone's water and wastewater services were frozen. This year there is a slight marginal increase proposed. The average monthly increase that our customer base will see is about $1.50. But as you can see from that chart before you, our proposed rate structure is still lower than our peers in the region with their fiscal year 2021 numbers. And finally, looking ahead over the next few weeks, um, we've received some notification of the next round of CARES funding. It's not in this proposal. We're still evaluating it with more details to come. We're still going through the state budget with uh, amendments expected with the budget adoption. We're going to continue holding the next three virtual community meetings. And as Mr. Linzel had said earlier, March 24th, we're going to hold our public hearing with budget adoption tentatively scheduled for April 7th. Thank you, uh, Mr. Durkin, and I uh, appreciate uh, the very detailed uh, presentation. It is high level, so again, this um, this is on uh, this budget is on the website at blueprint.chesterfield.gov, and you can review it in its entirety in a more detailed fashion. Uh, but now we're going to pivot and take some questions we received from the online form. The first question is: What is the proposed tax rate on real estate? With the increased assessments, most county homeowners experience interested to see if it will be a reduction to keep it neutral. The uh, first per, uh, question, the answer is, uh, the, it's the intent of the board uh, to keep the rate the same at 95 cents on real estate uh, for this fiscal year. And, um, you know, when we talk about tax rate in that discussion, uh, it really is a uh, an analysis of all of our revenue sources and then also what uh, what our goals are as a county. And so we tried to uh, have a um, in-depth um, discussion to see what it, what is our assessments uh, increase is going to be uh, from year in year out. And this year, I think the uh, the increase was an average of four point two five percent, I believe, countywide. And so that's um, it's a little larger than we're um, ordinarily uh, seeing in Chesterfield County. And so. Um, one of the things we do try to do is balance that out year over year within a four-year term. Um, Dr. Casey, do you want to follow up on that? Sure. It, it's a very good question. It's a fair question and really a question that should be asked annually of us about how we set the rate because we do take it seriously. Uh, there was one slide, a mix amongst all those slides that I think really raised you know, a, a lot of people's eyebrows, and, and including our friends on the school board side, and that is some of the state mandates and regulations that have been pushed down to us that we have actually lost revenues from or have incurred new costs. And, and one thing I think we need to do a better job of, quite frankly, is better quantifying it, uh, give some narrative to it, get you as citizens to understand the, the conundrum, quite frankly, that we're placed in. But uh, all things being equal, if we did not house over 300 inmates in our facilities that are meant to be in the state prison system, that is the equivalent of a penny on the tax rate. Uh, if the state did not take uh, a million and a half of our recordation taxes this last year uh, permanently, annually, and shift them to the Hampton Roads Bridge Project, that's a half of a penny on the tax rate. Uh, again, those are, those are narratives in the state budget that could have easily been fixed and amended by the state or again, in, in reference to the state compliance with inmates, the policy is, is that, uh, and it's a policy of the state, that we do not have to and should not have to hold inmates past 60 days that are meant for a state institution. There are many other issues that the schools face from state issues as well. So one of the things we're gonna be doing better because we want to be in a position to lower the tax rate. We wanna be in a position to take the, the growth, if you will, from uh, 
residential sales and drive down the tax rate, but we cannot do that and also cover the state for revenues that are lost or new costs that are incurred to us by the state. Uh, and it's the term unfunded mandate. So we will do a better job in the future uh, this summer in, in explaining that. Hopefully many of you who are asking that question can, can be on our side as we talk to our state delegation. All right, and the second question is, how much funding has been dedicated to sidewalks? And I think you just heard uh, Mr. Durkin uh, go into that in a little more detail, that we have uh, $19 million slated to go into um, sidewalks over the next five years in our five-year plan. And so that's something we definitely are going to do. The other thing to keep in mind, just um, serving on the transportation planning organization here in the Richmond region, is that you know there are a variety of funding sources for transportation, more than you can uh, possibly imagine, actually. And so our transportation department here in the county does a great job of following where grants are available uh, and pulling money down, competing for dollars with other jurisdictions regionally, and uh, piecing together projects. And so uh, that $19 million doesn't include those sources, I know, and uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, Gerard or Joe, do you all want to follow up on that answer? Uh, Mr. Winslow, I could... I could add too, and, and, and I've only been here for four years, but $19 million over a five-year CIP is probably our one, our, one of our most substantial investments. And that's not including what could arise for future projects from the CVTA funding, Transportation Authority, because sidewalks are, are included in the mobility uh, services that, that is uh, in, enabled by such legislation. So again, the 19, I view the $19 million as a base that you can only see be improved upon over time. And the $19 million does not include uh, what are development-driven projects that uh, private sector are, are doing in creating connectivity of their communities to businesses, their communities to schools, libraries, parks, as we work in uh, that through some of the development proposals. And again, that's, that's beyond the $19 million investment. All right, uh, question number three from Heather. We have yet to really see the impact of trauma on our citizens and communities. I understand that typically a budget utilizes the previous year to support the forward movement. Are there plans in place in our budget to support that, like the state's mental health block grant? Um, just, uh, and, and I think it's a great question, but one thing I think uh, all citizens in Chesterfield should know is that we essentially perform a zero-based budgeting process in Chesterfield. That is to say that we go through and analyze each department from scratch every year to determine what the needs are for citizens and the uh, pro productivity coming out of that department uh, before funding it. Uh, with that said, th th this is absolutely correct. Uh, we are we're just starting to see some of the impact and trauma from uh, the, this pandemic year. Uh, we've seen some of it certainly with uh, some mental health uh, items that have come up. Uh, we've seen uh, some, sadly, some suicide uh, attempts and some deaths in the county. And so this is an extremely important topic and our mental health department um, is its own, um, uh, is its, is its own entity, if you will, in terms of how they're going about addressing these needs. Uh, we have same day service in Chesterfield and we are serving citizens uh, every day at that, uh, at that department. Uh, Joe or Mr. Durkin, uh, either of you want to tack on to that one. I will, Mr. Winslow, too. And, and again, it sort of references the, the question before. We have been fortunate with the state and some of its mental health block grants. Uh, I think they recognize the value uh, and, and initiatives we have actually had as a locality before even some of the mental health legislation from a few years back. So we're proud of, of our attentive services, 24-7 services in that manner. Uh, having said that, there are a lot of initiatives of the state, a lot of new initiatives of the state that are coming our way that we also need to sort through is, again, figuring out what is our local share of the cost to be compliant with the laws, and, you know, what are some of the adverse uh, implications that arise when, you know, we are spending a lot more time transporting those in crisis, uh, those with temporary uh, detention orders, 
uh, hours and hours away from this area, but under the care and attention of someone that needs to safeguard them. Uh, those are all local resources. So we're trying to work hard with our regional partners and with the state to have such facilities, such crisis center facilities closer, such transportation roles assumed by others and contracted out. Because again, you know, our law enforcement personnel, quite frankly, are spending half a day sometimes transporting one person to a, a facility that by chance has an open bed. And, and we just need to do a better job here. But that's, that again costs money and we much rather invest that money locally and, and save the time of such officials. Question four is from Aaron. Uh, can you share the vetting and procurement process for construction contracts for installing sidewalks, uh, roads, et cetera, hope to avoid future Lux Lane timelines? Well, don't we all, uh, Aaron? Uh, you know, and I, I know there's a lot of reasons from a, a contract uh, management standpoint that, that Lux Lane is, has been delayed as long as it has, but um, uh, you know, very few projects in, in Chesterfield are like Lux Lane. That's really a, an outlier in terms of um, in terms of how much time it's taken. But we do use a low bid process, and uh, we follow the state code as it relates to procurement. And our department's very good about. Um, making certain that we're uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's and uh, ensuring that uh, taxpayers are getting uh, the best deal for their tax dollar. Um, either of you want to comment on uh, that procurement or a vetting question. I think it's safe to say, Aaron, that um, the, the contractor for Lux Lane may not be at the top of the list for future projects at Chesterfield County, but I, I don't want to, um, you know, overspeak, uh, and, and perhaps procurement has, has a different answer. <laughs> so again, if I could just interject, uh, and if anyone knows Lux Lane uh, better than anyone, it's the person to the right of me, Mr. Winslow, since he travels that uh, every day, many times a day. Uh, but having said that, uh, the county is, is mandated to follow the state procurement code. Uh, when a scope of a project is written down, we have to bid that out, and we have to award it to the most responsive and responsible uh, bidder. That Those are state definitions. At the time of the award, uh, the particular vendor was responsive and responsible under state standards. Uh, now, having said that with certain experiences, uh, that vendor may not necessarily be as responsive and responsible as they were when they initially submitted the bid, but we had to award it to such contractor. And, and as we just to tie up uh, Lux Lane, I, I do hear from staff that we are about 90 days out for that entire area to be operable and, and hopefully uh, safe and marked and ready to go. So hopefully about 90 days. I do appreciate the patience of every citizen who travels that road and uh, just bear with us a, f a little while longer. Hopefully we'll, we'll be done and uh, look forward to that. Next question, number five. With all the building of housing, apartments, et cetera, there is a growing need for new schools. New schools are built and are already overcrowded and needing trailers within a year or two of opening. So this is a good question, and it's, it's one that I think uh, I get asked fairly frequently. I, you know, the first thing to note, I think, is that the county, with with all of the zoning that does take place, and I would say about a third of all zoning cases actually make it through the entire process to get to the Board of Supervisors for an up or down vote, uh, first of all. But with, with all of the zoning cases going on in Chesterfield, we actually are growing at about one to one and a half percent a year, which equates to about 3,500 to 4,500 residents, depending on the year. And what we continue to hear from our demographer and our new program, which if you haven't checked it out, it's called Stratus, and Microsoft helped Chesterfield County put this program together. It is our uh, tool for projecting uh, facility needs in Chesterfield County. And it is, I think Jim Engel, uh, Supervisor Engel calls it the brain, uh, which I like, but it, it, it essentially takes data sets, many, many data sets, 
and uh, has an, uh, a formula that um, you know goes through an algorithm and it essentially projects what the students uh, are going uh, the students that are going to be generated by a given a case or a given um, uh, zip code or area and then we compile that data and look at what is going to be needed in that area so would say that uh, one of the things uh, we are looking at in Clover Hill, of course, we have the Tomahawk Creek Middle School. It's at, I think, 116% capacity. I am acutely aware that that school needs uh, another school uh, to take some of the pressure off. And I am hopeful that this Board of Supervisors, along with staff, will be able to identify a site very soon uh, to, to spill over and to take uh, sort of the more Western uh, uh, children that are being generated with developments out there. And so Tomahawk Creek can be a little more centrally located. And that effort is underway. It's also underway from a CIP perspective. We're making room for that with our bond referendum next year. And so that's something uh, that'll be an ongoing public discussion as well, which every citizen will have an opportunity to engage in. Um, but the other piece of this is what what size do we build schools? And, and uh, you know, I know that some areas are under more pressure than others. If you look at a Stratus map and just do some simple projections, you too can see, uh, and that's, uh, that uh, is available if you type in Chesterfield Stratus. I know you can get to that and take a look at it. Um, but you can see that certain areas of the county are under more pressure than others. Uh, for instance, we were discussing A.M. Davis uh, the other day at a board meeting and potentially having the need to build a little bit larger A.M. Davis than what we've built in other areas. That decision is not made. There's a lot of discussions to take place. But when we start to see great interest in certain areas, uh, over the next, uh, you know, five, ten years projections, we have to make uh, decisions about how large to build buildings. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, we want to have uh, buildings that are right size for the population that, are, that is present in a given area or district. Anybody want to tag on to that? All right. I, I, that means I did a good job on that question. Nobody wanted to tag on to it. All right, um, are there any additional questions? I'm looking at staff. This, is, this would be your, uh, your final call for questions if anybody has anything else that they want to ask. Otherwise, please don't be shy. You can reach me at winslowc at chesterfield.gov. Uh, we have, uh, again, uh, our Blueprint website, blueprint.chesterfield.gov. Send an email if you have any questions to blueprint at chesterfield.gov. And again, this is the second of five virtual community meetings. And so we're looking forward to uh, those other ones scheduled. And um, again, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Durkin. Thank you to staff for hosting this and making it uh, so informative for our citizens. Thank you so much.